So now we've reached the third uh, part of uh, parting from the four attachments. Looking back on the first two, we could say that that represents, as it were, the common level of teaching. Be, uh, common in the sense that it could be practiced by somebody who is simply following the path to liberation for themselves, the Shravaka path, as we've called it, as Atisha calls them, the person with the mediocre motivation of wanting, of seeing suffering in their own life and wanting to be liberated from it. But Atisha says in Lapa the Path of Enlightenment that the great motivation is possessed by the person who wishes to achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of, of all beings because they've seen suffering in their own life and they understand it affects all beings. So the two higher parts, the two last parts of the parting from the Four Attachments are in line with that. They're for the so-called the greater person, the person with the, this greater motivation. So here, if you like, begins the explicitly Mahayana part of the parting from the Four Attachments. Because the third attachment, remember, that Manjushri referred to in his original teaching to Sachin Kung and Impa was expressed in this way. Uh, if you have attachment to your own benefit, or if you like, your own welfare, you don't have bodhicitta. And bodhicitta, of course, means that very resolve, that very intention to achieve Buddhahood precisely because you're motivated by the wish to bring about, to find a means of bringing about the end of the suffering afflicting all beings, not just your own, but all beings. And not just that you wish to achieve them to achieve this freedom from suffering, but you're going to assist in that by fulfilling your potential to be a Buddha. So Bodhicitta is that is twofold in that way. It embraces the sufferings of others and concludes that Buddhahood is the answer to the suffering of others. Now, if you're only thinking of your own welfare, in the sense of, I suffer, therefore I must follow the path to end my own suffering, you don't have it. There's no room in your mind for bodhicitta. So it's like this is the kind of decisive dividing point between the Shravaka system and the Mahayana system. Now, this is not a sectarian point, because for many people, it's just a progress from one stage to the other. The Shravaka enters into the Mahayana whenever he or she generates this Understanding, I must achieve the a way, must achieve the level through which I can benefit all beings, you know, Buddhahood. But how do we overcome that attachment to our own benefit, to our own welfare? How do we break through that 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 more subtle obscuration? Because we've been through two traps so far. We've cut through two traps: attachment to this life, attachment to a good rebirth. Now we have a more subtle trap the privileging one's own spiritual liberation above the liberation of others. That's the trap. How do we cut through that? In short, the answer is bodhicitta. But it takes a lot for that sense of universal responsibility to arise. So generally the way it's taught in the parting from the four attachments system is that we cultivate it in three steps. Loving kindness, compassion, and then bodhicitta itself. Because loving kindness and compassion are like the catalysts that create the right, as it were, opening in one's heart so that one realizes that it's others who really matter, others suffering that I must be concerned with. If one starts from the, as it were, like where one's normally at, it's one's own sufferings, one's own happiness, which is preeminent, which is the driver for oneself. But when meditating loving kindness, something happens one begins to be aware of others. What is loving-kindness in Buddhism? Loving-kindness is the wish, may all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. And notice it's all beings. Because everybody has some love to at least a few favored people. But here we mean universal love. So it's limitless, it involves all beings. And it's not temporary, it's forever. That's the meaning, that's the love we want to develop. And how do we get to that? Actually, we get to it through gratitude. Gratitude to others is the is the 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 as it were the key to loving having loving kindness for them. Well, I have gratitude for a few people, but actually, I should have gratitude for all people because everybody's done something for me. Since I'm sorry, it's beginningless. There's not one person who has not helped one in previous lives, 
Most importantly, Fad, they've all been one's parents. Of course, I cannot remember that. The, begin, the, the stream of lives is beginningless. How could I remember? But nevertheless, it's so. So I have to take from this, the, my present parents, to whom I do have a sense generally of gratitude and do wish them to have happiness and the cause of happiness, I take from that and apply it to all beings. Until I feel with all beings, may they have happiness right now in their body and mind. And may they have the causes of future happiness. And as may they practice virtue. And that's very joyful. And when that's happened in one's heart, compassion is possible. Because compassion is tougher. Compassion demands one look at beings when they're suffering. Not when they're happy, but when they're suffering. And my sense of self-clinging is strong enough to, to make me fearful of that. I fear I may be contaminated. I may catch the suffering. So I have to be strong and positive and joyful in my heart to engage in compassion. And love will have made me that, because love brings about joy. So compassion proceeds the same way, out of a sense of gratitude for others, all that they've done for one, beginning with one's parents, and close people, right to all beings. They've all been a source of selfless support at one time or another for oneself in previous lives. So how, when I see them afflicted by sufferings now, and the sufferings that will follow from their ignorant and non-virtuous actions, how can I feel otherwise in it? May they be free from that suffering and cause of suffering. Now, my life is different now when I have this loving kindness and compassion because other beings have come alive to me in intensity. I feel their presence, their, their, their wishes, their hopes, their fears are, are colourful and vivid to me impinge upon me and therefore that drives me to think to my to ask myself how can I place them in happiness how can I free them from suffering I'm kind of pretty feeble I'm ignorant I'm afflicted by my own prejudices my own inabilities because of my disturbing emotions and ignorance and so on but there is a possibility I have the potential for true wisdom that could respond accurately to the sufferings of others and diagnose a cure. I have the potential for true compassion which can embrace others impartially with concern and I have the potential for effective action, for powerful action. I have those potentials. They're Buddhahood. I must therefore achieve that. Similar to, you know, somebody who's, uh, as a child, cares for the physical sufferings of others is often motivated to become a doctor similarly motivated by concern for all the types of suffering that beings have one generates this resolve to become a Buddha in a way to dispense the ultimate medicine of the Dharma to cure the sufferings of all beings so bodhicitta arises in this way through the catalyst of love and compassion to bodhicitta that very aspiration I will become a Buddha to benefit all beings. As Shantideva describes it, that thought arising in, my, in one's mind is like a flash of lightning in the dark night. It's like, he it says, it's like an alchemy that changes our human life into a wish-fulfilling gem. Whoever this has arisen in, this thought has arisen in, is transformed by it. Even though they're still a beginner in every way, apart from this, they're different because that thought is now the the animating spirit of their life. So bodhicitta arises, aspiration to become a Buddha for others and the application to practice the path. How do I keep that alive? So how do I keep that aspiration alive? How do I, I forge forward in the Mahayana, the great vehicle path to Buddhahood? Because the habits of self-clinging, of fearfulness, of self-protection and so on, so strong, uh, they can overwhelm that, that, that little flame of bodhicitta very easily, they can blow it out. So I need to really train to preserve that space for that flame to grow within me. And therefore in the Shempa Jiddha teachings, we say the best way is to train in the equalizing and exchanging of oneself with others. Most importantly, exchanging oneself for others. What does this mean? Well, Shantideva says, whoever wishes to achieve Buddhahood has to practice this supreme secret of exchanging oneself for another's. Essentially what it means is that 
actually the very thought here am I with my happiness and my fear of suffering and they are there is just a projection just an interpretation just a, a linguistic and conceptual designation what makes this self and the other other a habit I can undermine that habit I can weaken that habit and therefore create the space for real bodhicitta to grow by thinking well others are as important as me so why should I privilege this or even to put the balance right to get it to I really understand the equality of myself and others to train in taking others as myself and thinking firstly of their happiness and firstly of how to free them from suffering and taking this as the other this present self as other and the the seeming others as myself to put it in a very simple terms to walk in the shoes of others rather than one's own shoes to see things through their eyes and therefore to privilege them above oneself and this is a really radical way to 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 dismantle self-centeredness and self-clinging does it mean one should be a doormat to others no because to really embrace the needs of others doesn't mean to 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 give them the space to continue abusing oneself or others but it means thinking what is best for others truly best what is best for their real happiness and their real freedom from suffering so if one understands that then we'll always be equipped with the the most appropriate way to benefit others one can sum up this whole wonderful teaching of exchanging self for others in the practice of sending and taking which means that one should train in meditation when one's mind is relaxed enough and wholesome enough through loving kindness and compassion to take imaginatively the sufferings and causes of sufferings that afflict others into oneself and in return give them one's own happiness and one's own happiness and causes of happiness when i think oh well i'll be afflicted there by their by their suffering they'll become poisoned by their non-virtue not at all because suffering can only arise through self-clinging and in this very practice of opening out to others one is abolishing one's own self-clinging so only joy only happiness will arise through this practice of send and taking and it is a supreme means of guarding and strengthening one's bodhicitta so that is the way we train in and the antidote to the self-centeredness of being only concerned with one's own benefit the third of the four attachments <laughs>